All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, today, uh, our third SRS uh, series, and I am honored and very delighted to have our special guest, Dr. Uh, Lin Sterling who currently is the Director of Research Development Services. And we have another special guest, uh, Tony Sheffer, who served as the Director of the Corporate Partners Program uh, here at U of O. So please join me in welcoming our two wonderful guests today. Thank you. Give me a sense of who is in the room. Graduate students, some of you? Okay. So it's really wonderful to have Tony uh, with us today because he's he's been at U of O about uh, two months and he's director of the corporate partners program. So he resides over in the part of the university that's involved in fundraising from either individuals or from foundations or in his case foundations corporations. Um, and I work on the other side of campus, um, about as far from your office as I think we could get apart, but the MX connects us. I'm over in the Vice President for Research and Innovation. So while we might work together from time to time, we also have very different roles and we report to different units. So I'm the Director of Research Development Services. And our focus is entirely on faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, more on faculty and postdocs, quite frankly. And our job is to really help them and facilitate their obtaining research grants. Those could be in the form of grants that would fund science in terms of things that happen in a laboratory. It could be field research. It could be travel to archives. It could be fellowships that basically pay you for your time to work on a book or a manuscript or a publication. But basically that's our job is to work directly with faculty members. And sometimes the faculty members that we're working with are applying to foundations or corporate partners or in many cases the federal government that is funding the research. So let me take, I'm just gonna walk you through the services and the programs that we offer. Uh, most of this is focused on faculty support because as the University of Oregon strives to improve its research profile and strengthen its research portfolio, a lot of attention gets paid to how much do our faculty conduct research? How many of our faculty members are conducting funded research? Where are their fellowships coming from? Are they prestigious? Are they you know, competitive? Those kinds of things. And so a lot of my office is focused on maintaining the research status and productivity of the University of Oregon by working through faculty members. But we also provide help to graduate students, especially graduate students that are looking for uh, fellowships or programs that actually sometimes support their research with a faculty member jointly, those kinds of things. So I'm going to walk through uh, like I said, what my office does and what we provide, and then I'm going to give Tony a few minutes to talk about what he does, and then we're open for questions, comments, or conversation. And please stop me during any part of this to, to talk. I mean, it doesn't have to be a one-way conversation until the end. Okay, uh, let me just go back for a second. Uh, I, I do have a colleague, uh, Medusha Devastali, in the office that I work with. I primarily work in the humanities, the social sciences. I work in School of Journalism and Communications, School of Music and Dance, across those units. Medusha is, is a biochemist by training, um, and she also has a, a degree in public administration, and she tends to work with our scientists in biology, physics, chemistry, uh, and pretty much that side of the portfolio. So she's very familiar with the <coughs> Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health where my portfolio is much broader in terms of the kinds of agencies, but usually the grants I'm working with are smaller in terms of dollars. So uh, we are both members of the National Organization of Research Development Professionals. All I'm saying here is that there are people like us on almost every campus in the United States, and we primarily enable competitive individual and team research because the funding environment is so competitive. Uh, we function almost like coaches for faculty members who are trying to obtain research funding, um, and we provide a variety of services to them in that process. And uh, we also basically look a lot at partnerships, like where are our faculty members doing research that is also happening at another institution, or where our strengths might complement their strengths. 
so we also reach out to other institutions and other potential partners to say, gee, it would be interesting to collaborate on this project together or on this type of project together, or we need somebody with an expertise in um, parallel modeling. We don't have that at the U of O. Where is that a strength? And could we work with Carnegie Mellon? Or could we work with Oregon Health and Science University? Or could we work with another institution in terms of securing, again, securing funding? Um, because the external funding environment is so rich, but they're very targeted about what it is they want to achieve. And a lot of times, all of those strengths are not at one institution. So you really have to work across different institutions to put together collaborations um, that will eventually secure that external funding. And we basically also talk about best practices for attracting external funding for both scholarship and research. Um, so what is it that we could be doing? What are other institutions doing to make sure their faculty are prepared to compete? So, one of the things we do and one of the ways people know us is that every Tuesday at noon, we send out a newsletter that has that at the top and it says funding opportunities on it. So every week, I get probably between two and 300 different notices from every agency of the federal government, from private foundations, from corporations, from the Foundation Center, from Howard Hughes Medical Institute, from all different kinds of places. Um, and they basically cross my desk and I look through all of them and I pick out between 15 and 20 each week that I think are of broad interest to the research community that we have here at U of O. Now, obviously, U of O doesn't have an engineering school. We don't have a medical school. We don't have uh, animal science. We don't have pharmacology. So a lot of those things that are passing my desk are not going to be relevant to us. But it's my job and Medusha's job to figure out which ones are relevant and to make sure that we get those disseminated each week in this funding opportunities newsletter. In addition to that kind of broadband and fairly generic uh, funding opportunities newsletter, I'm also very glad always to meet with members of the faculty or graduate students and find out what their research is about and then go out and do a personalized funding search for them to say who is likely to be funding this work, who has funded work like this, you know, where should we start looking for funding based on your research profile. Okay. All right. And basically, I always, in my website, keep uh, track of the archive newsletter because sometimes opportunities come up every year around the same time. And so even though I haven't announced it yet, if you know that your opportunity is coming up in March, you can look back at my prior newsletter and say, oh yeah, the deadline last year, here's the link, I can read the RFA and see that it's coming out soon. So it's really, the funding world is a fairly cyclical environment where certain things happen at the same time every year and you can pretty much anticipate when you're gonna get your funding opportunities. Not entirely, because things change every year too, but for the most part, you can develop kind of a predictable cycle of, of when things get announced and available. So, we also provide training and professional development <coughs> opportunities for faculty members. We do a big grant writer seminars and workshops uh, day, once every two years. This is primarily for scientists who are funding, getting funding from NIH and NSF. Once in a while, NIH is interested in some kind of dissemination strategies or ways that health is linked to journalism or other kinds of media, uh, and that can sometimes be interesting. Um, we do that every two years. We also do a lot of workshops um, every year that based on particular programs that get offered by the federal government every year to make sure that our faculty is applying and is competitive. And we basically do specialized workshops on requests. So for example, in the last couple of years, one department or other kind of research centers or units call me in and I just do a workshop just for them on, on who are the best funding opportunities, <coughs> where are the best funding opportunities for their type of research, and what do we need to learn about writing successful proposals in that field. Um, and a lot of times I, I try to have example winning proposals, examples and things like that that we kind of look through together. Okay, other kinds of things we do. Obviously we're particularly interested in getting new faculty members off to a strong start. So we do an early career program for new faculty. This is particularly important again in the sciences because if they don't get funding for their science, then they cannot conduct research. It's the grant that pays for the research and the research that leads to the publication, and the publication which becomes 
uh, the valuable output of their research and then starts the next cycle of applying for funding, conducting research, and getting publications. So it's particularly critical that new faculty in the sciences get off to a <laughs> start. But not only new faculty in the sciences, we also do work with faculty across the campus. But it tends to be a habit, like a lot of things, if people get in the habit of seeking funding. Um, then they tend to keep doing that. Um, and every couple of years they land something and it's uh, it's just like cultivation, right? You have to stay at it, you have to keep it on your radar, you have to do work every day and every week and every month to make sure that your proposals are going out um, in order for your funding to come in. So we also do an external review program. Um, so this is typical when faculty members have submitted a proposal and it's been rejected. So it hasn't been funded. Um, we basically, uh, they get a chance to resubmit it, but we, before we send it out that second time, we send it to a panel of experts who understand the agency, who understand that program, who maybe sat on that review panel, and they look through that proposal really carefully and give the team or the faculty member really good feedback about how to strengthen their proposal before it gets submitted again. Just like you might have a, well, you will certainly do this with your thesis or your dissertation, um, you'll have a lot of people look at it before you'll finally submit it. And it gets better, it's very painful, but it gets better every time because you're getting feedback and you're strengthening your argument and things like that. So this is very similar. We also provide uh, visualization and graphic design services, the way the funding world is going. The visual aspects of a proposal can now be very important and very compelling and very powerful, persuasive tools. Um, more recently, we've had a couple of requests from funders who don't want to receive paper anymore. They want to receive a uh, five-minute TED Talk on research. Um, and so we work with faculty to develop effective videos, <coughs> effective graphics, effective you know, visual tools to help communicate their research. It would be really interesting to work with the journalism school in producing some of these things because the scientists have wonderful knowledge of science, but not always great uh, ability to explain it. Um, and journalists are usually very good at explaining things to a public lay audience, but not always you know, uh, as engaged in deeply, as deeply in science. Um, so I've often thought that there's two opportunities, I think, within the School of Journalism and Communication to work with funded researchers. One of them is in this way, um, communicating science, making sure that the public becomes more scientifically literate, engaging in citizen science, and those kinds of things. And the other place I see a lot of uh, crossover is in terms of environmental work that happens uh, at U of O and journalism. Environmental journalism has got to be quite an interesting arena uh, for people to work. So that's uh, what we primarily provide. I do have a pretty robust website. Um, and it's at rds.uoregon.edu, and everything I'm going to talk about is accessible, obviously, from that website. But um, basically, I have a section on funding and awards. That's where you can archive the, or find the archived versions of the Funding Opportunities Newsletter. You can find a list of fellowships and awards that are available. Internal funding, which is what we make available to faculty members, limited submission calendar, and lots of links to external funding and resources. I'm going to talk through some of these other things. Resources primarily for grant writing. Um, if you're having to submit a data management plan, which you have to do if you're a scientist in terms of how you're going to manage and handle your data, we have some examples there. And in services, training, professional development, external review, proposal development, which is basically us working one on one with faculty members and coaching them through the development of a proposal. As I said, visualization and graphic design. And we also decide. Uh, at the university who becomes a principal investigator, which just means that they basically are financially responsible for the funding that comes in. But it encompasses certain kinds of training to make sure that the U of O as an institution is stewarding those resources effectively. So a lot of people have the misconception that when somebody gets a grant, um, that they just get a bunch of money and then they walk away with it. But it's really not like that. It's more like a contract. It's like people have given you a contract to do something with that money. And they want to know at certain points in time what you have gotten done and how much you have expended. And you report back to them, usually once or twice a year, on what's happening with that money. Because that really is somebody else's money. And they give it to you to do something with it. Just if you, like if you hired a plumber to do something at your house, 
you would want to see some outcome from that. So although that's not a, a, a sophisticated example, it's a lot like a grant um, because you, people have awarded you money to do something and you have then the obligation to either do it or to return the funding. You owe as an institution is held responsible for all of the different monies that come in. And for U of O, that's about $115 million a year that we have to track and manage through the work of faculty members and principal investigators and graduate students and postdocs and trainees and things like that. So it's a lot of responsibility on the part of the institution, and we are audited frequently uh, to make sure that we are handling that money appropriately. It's being expended the way people said it would be expended. Okay, so principal investigators have to go through some particular training to make sure that they are good stewards of the resources that they receive. When I talk about proposal development services, I really mean this is, you know, uh, like being a personal coach uh, to people who are developing pretty complex proposals. Most of these are 15 to 20 pages in length, and they have a lot of, you know, intense content. And so we're basically working with faculty members and teams of faculty members to make sure all the parts and pieces of that come together. A lot of times it's just helping people get organized, developing a strategy for their proposal, just like you might organize a strategy for a thesis or a paper that you're developing, and basically get uh, non-technical sections developed that we can work with them on. Obviously, we're not scientists, or at least I'm not a scientist, uh, Producers is a biochemist, but, uh, but a lot of this is sort of practical common sense. Um, my own PhD is in rhetoric from Penn State, so I have a degree in argument. Um, and basically, a proposal is a good argument. Um, it's a very compelling argument to carry out some kind of research that, because of its significance, its importance, its impact, its population, those kinds of things. Um, so that's kind of the background that I bring to it. Um, and we always provide proofreading and copy editing. So. Just get pretty wild in the last 24 hours before a submission, and to just having somebody go through and proof and copy edit and make sure that all the errors are fixed and um, all the typos are prepared and all of those kinds of things can sometimes be a tremendous service. And obviously, like anything else, um, a proposal makes an impression on an audience. Um, and if the people that are reviewing the proposals are seeing a lot of typos and errors, they're saying, well, what kind of science are they going to? Or what kind of work are they going to do? What kind of research are they conduct if they're sloppy in their proposal? So it's an important um, point, although usually left to the very last minute. <laughs> okay, we also manage a limited submission calendar. Basically, there are certain opportunities every year that come through the U of O where we can only submit one. So we have to decide everyone at U of O might, I mean, there might be five people that want to compete for a particular award. But we have to have a process internally first to decide which one moves forward. And so we manage that process. It doesn't matter much for journalism. But we basically make sure that we have a procedure in place to make sure. Because if we go forward with two proposals and the agency or the foundation gets two from U of O, then we're not that entirely. We, are, we, we, we become, um, you know, we, we get omitted from the competition. So it's a, Tricky to make sure that you know we're doing we're following the guidelines, and so we're kind of the referees. Okay, all right. One of the other things is that the vice president for research and innovation always provides some pilot or seed funding, some internal funding programs for faculty that are looking to develop projects or programs for external, for eventual external applications. And so these are things that we run on an annual basis. So faculty research awards I just announced in. Two weeks ago, and I just announced again yesterday, these are awards that are available to faculty. They are provide up to $5,500 um, for travel, uh, for summer stipend, for graduate or undergraduate assistance, uh, for those kinds of things. And the deadline on that is November 27th at 5 p.m. It's the Monday after the Thanksgiving holiday of the year. And we usually get about, oh, 50 or 60 applications, and we usually fund 20 to 25 proposals. So that's pretty good odds. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a faculty panel that makes the determinations. I have 11 panelists who will read all those applications and decide which of them will get funded with the vice president. 
We also have something called incubating interdisciplinary initiatives, again, for faculty. If you want to collaborate and work with colleagues in another part of the university, these awards are up to $50,000 for two years for collaborative interdisciplinary projects. In other words, not just journalists or not just chemists or not just biologists, but people that are working together in some kind of interdisciplinary way to, to pursue a project. And several of our School of Journalism and Education faculty have been part of the teams on incubating interdisciplinary initiative awards. We also do new junior faculty research awards. Basically, if you're a new faculty member at the University of Oregon at the assistant professor level, it's just an automatic award. And basically, we also do interdisciplinary awards in the humanities and social sciences. And again, journalism faculty have been competitive in that award program. That's 25K over one year. May I, may I interrupt for a second? Sure. Yeah, so can speaking of the internal award programs, including I3 and other type of awards, can our graduate students be part of those awards? They can be part in terms of salary. They can be paid from those awards, mm -hmm. but they can't be PIs. Sure. They yeah. can't be applicants. Yeah. But they can certainly. As being a collaborator or being research assistant or yes. project Re assistant. Usually it's called research assistant. Okay, research is good to know. Thank you. And that's almost always the case with uh, the, the larger award programs. Sure. There are graduate students written into the award mm -hmm. and paid through the award funding. Great. Okay, so I also work a lot with fellowships and awards. I work a lot with faculty members that are pursuing individual awards for their scholarly work um, and fellowships that give them time to develop manuscripts and things like that. I maintain a calendar. On my website, um, this is an old shot, but it's been updated. <laughs> um, and just kind of keep people on the campus aware of all of the different fellowship opportunities that come up, and, you know, throughout the year that they can apply for. Um, and basically, a fellowship is largely a chunk of money awarded to you on the merit of your project to give you time to develop that project. It's usually a manuscript of some kind of book project. It might be a digital project. It might be something else, but typically it's what I would call scholarship. Mm -hmm. And always, uh, the U of O is invited to nominate people as well. Um, so in other words, the faculty member, him or herself, cannot apply, but the U of O is invited to nominate for the Carnegie Fellows Program or the Mellon New Directions Fellowship. So we basically have to, again, canvas internally and get applicants and then decide who's going to move forward as U of O's nominee. And then we help with the letters of nomination. We make sure that we're adhering to the guidelines. We make sure that the CVs of those faculty members are looking really good. And we make sure that the application package is complete and thorough and compelling. So that's pretty much what we do. Um, I want to turn it over to Tony for just a second so that he can talk a little bit about what he does. Um, and has joined us in just the last couple of months. So still getting his, his feet wet here at U of O, but he's playing a really important role in terms of U of O's relationship um, with corporate partners. Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, I actually think yeah, Linda initially invited me here for a couple of reasons. One is to introduce what I'm doing. I am the director of corporate relations here at the University of Oregon. Um, that is a newly envisioned role here at the university. In the past, we had people that were in charge of corporate partners programs, which a lot of universities have, and that's really kind of just chasing after different corporations, trying to get $5,000, $10,000 gifts so the corporation can get their name on a wall somewhere, and, and we can feel good and build that up. But that wasn't really leading to big impact across the university. Um, so what was created is this new corporate relations role where really my primary objective right now is just to increase engagement with corporations and industry across a wide array of um, uh, areas on campus. Um, that includes trying to get more intern opportunities for students at different corporations, um, seeing corporations want to sponsor specific research, sponsor research especially big in the science industries, um, have having more corporations take part in recruiting, um, just basic things like that. And the idea is that really once corporations are becoming more engaged, more invested in the university, like down the road, they are going to be more likely to, you know, contribute, to invest, to really feel the University of Oregon is a partner for them. And 
that's really kind of also important today because corporations are not nearly as philanthropically minded as they once were. I know some people might not believe that, but yeah, they're, they're out to make money and they want to return on investment. And that's really what uh, we're trying to do. We're trying to find mutually uh, beneficial points of alignment where they need talent in certain areas. And we have a great program in those areas and we can kind of connect on that. And they see that University of Oregon is really channeling talent into them. And this should be something they should be taking a closer look at our programs and seeing if they should be supporting them with monetary grants. So that's really what I'm doing right now, what I've been tasked with at the University of Oregon uh, to develop this program. It's brand new. Um, and so far it's been going good. We're starting with some focusing on a small handful of corporations that can uh, partner with us across a wide range of ways. Uh, Thermal Fisher is one, it's a new gene, Intel, obviously is the big one at Oregon. IBM, mean, things like that, we're really trying to establish deep relationships with those corporations. Um, and the second reason I think Lynn uh, invited me here, especially, is this the, are you all journalism graduate students mostly here yes. in the room? Okay, so previous to this, I worked at NPR. Um, I was the uh, director of institutional giving for the science desk at NPR, which meant that I was um, the primary fundraiser working with foundations and corporations to raise funds to support their um, science journalism, mm -hmm. um, which was at NPR in the headquarters at DC, the largest desk um, with about 40 journalists and covering issues in health, global health, uh, the environment, um, physics, you know, astronomy, all basically a wide range. Um, and honestly, as future journalists, this is an important part. I mean, a lot of you think they're they going to go out there and, you know, do the stories and, that's all, and kind of that'll be it. You'll be working on your own and doing that. But really, in organizations across the board, fundraising is becoming an incremental part of their um, real revenue strategy. Um, not, not as many people are, you know, buying or subscribing to newspapers. Even the New York Times, the subscriptions are going low, and they're starting to really kind of adopt NPR's model of going and having foundation partners that are giving to support certain areas, going to corporations to do um, certain kind of uh, partnerships and areas, um, and also some advertising. Uh, one of the Things I didn't really do and NPR is hopefully not going to do is native advertising. How many of y'all know what that, that is? Um, in case you don't, it's, if you're ever on the New York Times website, you'll see a, there's a little line that says sponsored uh, content, and then you'll see like a story that's designed specifically to look like a New York Times story. That's called native advertising. And that's basically corporations are spending money to kind of put in a, either feel good stories a lot of times or otherwise it's um, just kind of stories that highlight how good of a company they are. It's a little higher ed is doing that now. Huh? Chronicle higher ed does that. Chronicle higher ed, yeah, a lot of people yeah. are doing that. NPR is trying not to. There's they're starting to blur the line, but I mean it's they really um, saw themselves as being a fact based, unbiased news source. Um, and so they don't really want to seem like a corporation is really coming on there and impacting what they write and how they're reporting. Um, but yeah, so those are basically just quick, very quick overviews of my my work here and my work at NPR. So I don't know. I guess okay. So we can open it up to questions. Yeah. Yes, yes, Q&A's. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So can we come brainstorm ideas with you guys? Uh, is that something that's all right? Like, yeah. some of the, I know you mentioned that you do that, but I'm interested also to talk about some corporate partnerships. Uh, it's something I'm working on. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely can. You know, yeah. I will say that the funding world for journalism is kind of a tricky one um, because mm -hmm. you know there's folks out there like the James. John Us and James Almeida Foundation that fund they were big newspaper family, newspaper chains, and they do do 
they made grants, but primarily they were interested in what's the evolving business model for journalism? How does that going to work? And so that was one of the things that they did for probably a decade or more, maybe they're still doing, I don't know. Yeah, there's some big funders in the journalism yeah. world, there's still yeah. a lot of uh, a yeah. good funder than Right, and mm -hmm. the other thing I saw recently was, um, so Michelle Alexander's book, um, uh, the New Jim Crow mm -hmm. was about the criminal justice mm -hmm. uh, system, and, and I just something I was looking at not too long ago. I had read that book, and um, and somebody in my reading group said, you know, there's a there's an organization now, kind of a boutique journalism group mm -hmm. that is looking at criminal justice reform, and they are basically doing the journalism and then selling the stories to the major media outlets. And it was again sort of a uh, interesting. Uh, yeah model of how journalism could look in the next 10 or 15 years, where mm -hmm. journalists develop these very deep, uh, you know, areas of interest, and then they end up being kind of this little team of investigative journalists who are working to place stories in major media and get paid for it, a lot like individual investigative journalists are mm -hmm. around the country. So there's, there's funding for journalism, but the study of journalism, I think, is a little bit of a harder uh, thing mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. seek funding for. Uh, mm -hmm. So people are willing to pay sometimes for investigative journalism on particular topics mm -hmm. or in particular geographic areas or things like that. Yeah. But you know, journalism as a study, you know, is, is a little harder, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that's primarily the case as it was at NPR is that most funding is restricted, which means that you have it has to be focused on a certain area. Um, and a lot of the questions we'd often get is like how are you like one of the more important things that we always had be tasked as a fundraisers at NPR was ensuring a firewall between our um, journalists and the funders because you never, as an independent news organization, you never want to make it seem like a funder is affecting what you're writing about. And so it is really, they do come and support a specific topic like health. And you, sometimes, like, if it got even too specific, like if they wanted to support journalism on diabetes, they couldn't do that. But if they want to support like our health group, people who are good on health and they're going to write what they're going to write, then that's what, what we would go for, which is often a challenge because as a fundraiser, it's kind of usually you hope to say that this money will do this. But at NPR, it was like, we're doing this. We hope you'll give us money. <laughs> if you don't, we're still going to do it, but it would be better if you're not. So um, I, I hate talking about my personal thing, but mm -hmm. I, I try to subscribe to the uh, your list sir to get the not only newsletter but also all the kind of constantly updated information about the funding opportunities internal and external so when Lynn mentioned kind of the internal announcement to send out to you know the, the entire university community talking about the internal funding opportunities including the i3 and i was wondering i've been waiting to receive but i have not received uh, you know, any information yet yeah, since July. July. No, yeah. Okay, so you can subscribe so online on my website. I, I, had, I, right. I, right. I did several times. Okay. So, right. yeah, is there any way for you to include someone specifically on the list to serve yeah, rather than through your email. online yeah. system? Yeah. Okay, I will email you. Yeah, yeah. so. Email me about that problem and we'll resolve it. Uh, okay, it's, it's yeah. Yes, then uh, going back to what you're talking about, uh, you know, in terms of what we do at, at SOJC, we are not only at a professional school, but also research purpose to school. But uh, the name, uh, as name indicated, we have a diverse group of scholars, researchers, and practitioners who are specialized in not only journalism, but also communication broad sense, and I would say media service. So, like, you know, uh, one third are in journalism and new technologies, the other uh, one third are in the humanities and one third in other uh, more qualitative uh, you know, social sciences. So we have diverse group of scholars in mostly quantitative or qualitative social sciences and humanities. So uh, as far as kind of, you know, building more interdisciplinary research program, I think we, are uh, yeah, in good position. Uh, but going back to uh, kind of the relationship, co co uh, collaborative effort between scientists and what we do, um, you know, one of the five presidential initiatives, uh, which was recently announced, is 
uh, the center media center for science and technology. Uh, that's uh, you know our dean's initiative uh, as well. So we are super excited about working together with the scientists. Uh, but we strive to figure out what would be the opportunities for us to work together with the scientists as far as external funding opportunities go. Would you share any kind of collaborative opportunities in seeking extramural grant to working with the scientists? Well, I think, um, uh, of course, quickly, as uh, one kind of already mentioned this, um, where like, as there aren't that many funding opportunities strictly just for journalism. There right. are a lot for others, and science journalism is one of the biggest ones right now. Obviously, with the uh, last couple of years, um, with the climate change denial and kind of science happening, it's getting questioned a lot in mainstream media. Um, a lot of foundations that previously just supported science and research have really identified that it's important for the greater public to have a better understanding of what science is and okay. what it means, like and taking this kind of complicated language of research reports and bringing it into that level of, you know, just straight journalism where people can really understand that. Um, so there are a lot of foundations that are really supporting what they call science and literacy or public understanding of science, where a lot of journalism organizations are going to. And so that was where a lot of my research was when I was looking for potential funders at NPR, um, and we had a lot of success with uh, Foundations that are interested in help. Our Wood Johnson Foundation was one of our biggest supporters, and they wanted the public to have a better understanding of the health issues happening. Uh, Rita Allen Foundation was one of our most recent ones, and they previously only supported research, but they started supporting Joe's big idea because they wanted the NPR listeners to get a you know, look behind the lab coats, basically, and see what scientists are really doing and why this is something that you know should be. Trusted and that you know is important to the functioning of society. You know, it seems like that should be obvious. Right. The other thing I'll just add is that you know the National Science Foundation. For every grant proposal that goes into the National Science Foundation, it needs to address broader impacts. And so broader impacts can mean lots of different things, but basically within that grant, you have to talk about what is the um, what is the broader impact of the work that you are doing and how will you have a broad impact with the research that you're proposing. And so I think that's a wonderful opening um, to, to reach out to communication and new media and journalism and talk about the broader impact of the research. Um, so a lot of times broader impacts translates into pipeline into STEM or educational type efforts and that's also a broader impact. Um, but I think we haven't been very creative, and we could be more creative at the U of O in terms of developing broader impacts uh, that have to do with communication and, and science and, and literacy and things like that. There's also a program here. There's two things I want to talk about, um, and I'm not sure if you already know about these or if you might want to learn more about them. One is called the Science Literacy Program, and that was funded initially by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I worked on that grant probably seven years ago, uh, but they funded the University of Oregon um, to look at our curriculum in terms of how are we incorporating students who are non-science majors into science courses in a way that makes them more scientifically literate. And that is, if you just look up science literacy program, you'll see there's a very robust series there of workshops and activities and meetings and guest speakers. You might want to stop in and visit with them sometime. Right? They're a great, wonderful group of people, and they're very engaged in that issue. We also have some funding on campus from Alan Alda, um, who, um, what's his program? Uh, pardon me? No, not that one. <laughs> Alan Alda was on MASH, if you're old enough to remember MASH, but, uh, or you watch the reruns. Um, but um, Alan Alda got really interested uh, in the later stages of his life in science, and he funded this program first at Stony Brook University in New York, and this, the vice president that I report to, David Conover, came here from Stony Brook, had landed that gift, at, and then brought Alan Alda here. So there's a whole program that's developing around making, making scientists better communicators, helping them develop more tools, more methods, more techniques, 
to communicate their science. And I think that journalism could provide a tremendous boost there to uh, to their activities. And so that um, that's another program. I think if you just go into the U of O website and put in Alan Olga, I think it would come up. <laughs> I forget what exactly what it's called. But it's, it's about helping scientists. You know, you're looking at TED Talks, and they're doing such a great job, right? But that's really hard to do, to, to take really, really complex ideas and to transform them into punchy, quick, witty, funny, engaging mm -hmm. stories that really capture people's attention. Um, so that is uh, that's part of what the Alan Alda thing is mm -hmm. trying to do, um, and uh, and just trying to really get us all a little bit more sophisticated about the idea that no matter how great your idea is, you have to get it across mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. to someone mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. I guess we have more questions from floor. So yeah, Petra. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess this is sort of, you said that you, you will help with postdoc applications and things like that. Depends on the nature of the postdoc. Post yeah. Okay, and, and I guess sort of like, what's the time frame, like if we want to engage you around those sorts of questions, do we just email you directly? Yeah, or? Just email me. Okay. But, okay, so I'll tell you. There are people that email me five years before they're going to apply for something because that's they're thinking what it is. And that's okay. I will meet with them and help them get lined up. There are people that email me at midnight when their application is due at 10 a.m. That's, awesome. that's not so good. Because then really I can say, you know what, I could probably proofread this between 7 and 8, but that's as much as I'm going to be able to offer uh -huh. you because if we start dealing substantively with the content, you're going to freak out and miss your deadline. So, um, so there's the there's the gamut, there's the range, and I think if you're looking at a postdoc, you should be talking to me about three months, three to four months before it's due, to start getting all your proverbial ducks in a row and making sure that it's going to be, you know, you're going to do a little bit of work on it every day for three or four months, and it's going to be good when you send it in. But really, anything less. I just, you know, if this is an important part of your career and your trajectory, then I would put some time into it. And I think it's worth that time. You're, it's competitive. You are competing. So think of yourself as an athlete. If you are competing on the volleyball court or on the football field, you have to work out every day. Being a scholar is not that different. You have to work out every day. You have to get up and make time for that every day. And whether that's a postdoc application or a grant application or a working on your thesis or your dissertation, it's, it's the habit um, that really helps, I think. And that's when I see our most successful you know, scholars here at U of O who land fellowship after fellowship after fellowship, they're often resented by their colleagues, right? <laughs> but actually, they're working really hard, and they're not going to battle with hard because they have developed that habit um, of working all the time, every day. They don't let their ideas sit for too long. So, um, for individuals who might be interested in NSO, NSO, mm -hmm. like behavioral science type um, mm -hmm. application, will you be the right person to conduct our private division? Um, if it's a social science application going to NSF, usually I work with it. Okay. And Vidusha is more um, science. You know, science, science, hard science. Mm -hmm. Physics, not that it's harder, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about physical sciences, um, mm -hmm. chemistry, biology, physics. Mm -hmm. But the NSF, uh, social science directorate, um, and yes. I, can, I work with economists, I work with social scientists, and I work with the law school. Social science is wrong. And when I send out my funding opportunities, I put those under, you know, there's categories, I put, and I put those under social sciences and law. Yep. Um, are there more, like, media studies based um, grant opportunities that you know of? Because I heard you guys talk a lot about journalism, but does that encompass like specifically yeah. media studies? I think that right now, I mean, journalism encompasses media. I mean, that they're kind of the same thing at this point. I mean, it's really, but it's really, you know, it's kind of like a when you get into questions of method. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know, research always centers around either a question or a hypothesis or a problem, right, that you're framing. Mm -hmm and then some kind of outcome or objective that you're trying to achieve through your research and some kind of method that pulls all that together. Uh, so I think that one of the most challenging things in terms of getting a proposal together is, is what I call creating a logic model to help really understand the nature and scope of the problem and who it impacts or affects, what outcome you're going to 
research is going to eventually result in and what method is going to pull that together. So that's kind of what makes it different than scholarship, which can oftentimes be developing a, an idea. Um, I think research requires um, methods. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really interesting to think about the question of methods in any discipline. Um, Actually, to kind of piggyback off of um, Brandon's question, uh, there, there are a number of us, um, we've spoken a lot about you know, science, science communication, professional journalism, and there are a number of us that are engaged in probably a much more um, sort of academically oriented and potentially humanities focused line of inquiry. Yeah. And so, do you, I'm sure you don't have exact numbers off the top of your head, but do you see, um, any significant amounts of funding available, especially for later stage um, doctoral students for things like you know, field work, interviews, um, archival yeah, visits, things absolutely. like that, less oriented towards uh, some specific research product or deliverable, but no, like absolutely. you said, that yeah, there's, the, I would say you're in the realm of fellowships, okay. travel to archives, okay. you know, field work, um, and those typically come up under, you know, kind of that individual research. So I don't have time to go through it today, but I would really suggest that any and all of you make an appointment with Katie Len, K-A-T-Y-L-E-N-N. -N. She's at the Knight Libraries. And have her walk you through the foundation directory. Uh, it, there's two versions of it. There's the online professional foundation directory, which is mostly oriented to institutions that are applying for grant funding. And there's one that's called foundation directory online for individuals. And that's where all the fellowship and creative opportunities are. So there's residencies, there's you know travel awards, there's those, all those kinds of things are listed there. And so you can basically do a, a pretty robust search uh, using keywords or uh, things like that to try to narrow them down in ones that will be interested in your work, the kind of work that you're doing, and sometimes your geography. Uh, there's a great deal of international interest too in um, in basically, uh, you know, the power of well, anyway, the, the, the power of analyzing different things in different mm -hmm. countries. I mean, just say it's more international right now than I think I've ever seen it in terms of people mm -hmm. willing to fund, um, you know, travel. Mm -hmm. That's actually very good to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, you we have to always look at the details, you know, but um, but I would definitely spend some time with that directly for individuals if what you're seeing is as an individual scholar or artist or creative person or you know uh, that's what you're looking for. Yeah, that's Thank really you. Good too. And Katie right. Len is amazing. She's a really good resource. Mm -hmm. And so you know work with it a little bit on your own and then go do a search with Katie and she actually goes to New York City every year to go through the workshop um, and learn how to use that database to its utmost. Same. Uh, so um, this goes back to the conversation you were having earlier. Is there a pipeline or mechanism in place to, let's say, put people in this researchers and this um, a school um, um, in touch with scientists' um, projects, right? So they can collaborate on other mechanisms in place to make sure that happens. Not so much yeah. because the scientists are kind of over there doing their thing mm -hmm. in the British laboratories. Mm -hmm. and you're over here doing mm -hmm. your thing in Allen Hall. But I think the science literacy program is a really way to connect mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that Allen Hall, the project that I talked about, is a really good way to connect mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. If there's particular kinds of science you're interested in, okay. then I would march up. You know, I would find people. Um, that are doing that kind of research and go introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things that doesn't happen very often is that people are always looking for formal channels to meet the people on campus that they need to meet, when actually you should probably just phone them up and see if they want to meet you for coffee. Mm -hmm. And most scientists like to talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. yes. By the way, I bump into folks at the new yeah. faculty orientation yes. where I met several yes. who are specialized in science right. literature programs. Yes. Right. So, so I think the new faculty orientation that we're having. Are you going to be at the McMoran House on Monday? No, but okay. Yeah. But uh, but there's also the new faculty lounge. Right. Right. So yeah. anyway. But I plan to reach out to yes. folks in the yeah. science leadership program. Right. Right. It's right. a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. so uh, you know, given my role and position here at SOJC, I'm particularly interested in creating opportunity for us to learn more about how to write more compelling 
more persuasive, <laughs> more attractive grant proposal. So uh, I know we have some, you know, a time crunching, but uh, I'm wondering whether if you, you know, uh, would be you know, able to help us yeah. towards, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in hosting yeah. some kind Maybe of workshop. The, yes. Uh, the spring term would be better than the right. term for me. And right. to just kind of walk through the nuts and bolts of a proposal mm -hmm. and all the different parts and pieces it has to include, mm -hmm. it, you know, just as a sort of a 30,000 foot overview, it sometimes helps um, people just get started. Sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. I think we learned a great deal about what your office does. So thank you so much.